Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Everett, and along with my wife, Michelle Everett, we are the host of God's Kingdom, where we discover in the Word of God that we are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and a special treasure unto our God. Now, join us as we enter into God's Kingdom. I want us to look this time at how the New Testament writers consider what they had read about and basically what they had heard about uh, because history was passed down orally in most cases. And so what they had heard about here of this particular event because the importance of this was that God was getting ready to release and birth a nation. It wasn't just bringing some slaves out of slavery and out of bondage, but it was the birthing of a nation so that they could represent the kingdom of God in the earth and give it a face. He said, Moses, tell them who they are. He said, tell them that they are a holy nation. Tell them that they are a kingdom of priests. Tell them that they are a chosen generation. Tell them that they are a peculiar people. Why was it important for God to tell them who they are? Because they did not know who they were anymore. In 400 years time, they had lost a sense of reality of who they were and all they thought they were Pharaoh's bondmen that was their identity and so one of the first things that the Lord does for us is he helps us to really embrace our true identity and whether it's through a ministry you know whether the Lord communicating this through the word he'll make sure that we understand who we are and our identity is stable. And so back in the 80s, when the Lord talked a lot to the church about who you are in Christ because of who he is in you, then that should have stabilized us. And it should have really settled some of these issues of where the orphan spirit was dispelled. But unfortunately, you know, there's so many complications in the human psyche that it didn't happen that way. But it's like the Lord said, all right, now let's approach this differently. And I want to give you scripture that will help you to really settle this thing in people. Because Jesus said to the apostles, John, again, chapter 14, that I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Because that was the big issue. When Adam left the garden. And he had to figure it all out on his own. He left as an orphan. And that orphan spirit. Entered into the human experience. And so it is something again. That the Lord begins to dispel of. When he tells us things like this. Now. Are you the sons of God? Right now. Not in the future. Now. That's who you are. Further he would say. He came unto his own and his own received him not. 
but as many as received him. To them he gave the power that is exousia, the authority, the right to be sons of God. And so he wants that settled for us. And so what Moses was about to do here, because of, number one, the dispatching of the messenger, the shalia, the Lord's shalia. He didn't just leave it to any angel. This wasn't Gabriel. This was the angel that represented the Lord himself. That's how important this mission and this cause was. Because what was to be birth as the byproduct of this, we couldn't just hit and miss here. That's why not just anybody was chosen. I love something that was in one of uh, Michelle's meet Egger quotes. Moses was once a basket case. Remember, he was placed in a basket and his name Moses means drawn out of the waters. Well, that a preach itself, drawn out of the waters, the waters being the word or the spirit, God drew out in order to send him at the appointed time when he was 80 years old. <laughs> And I, and, and you know, and I, and I and I look at that, and I said, okay, if Moses did his most effective work at age eighty, that means I got fifteen more years of development to go, to do my most effective work. And then Moses lived, of course, forty years beyond that. Have you ever thought about really living one hundred and twenty years? Everybody. You really, you really thought about that? Living 120 years. Well, you know that that was the assignment that was connected to an inferior covenant. And we carry it over as though it is still sacrosanct today. But that was what he said back in Genesis chapter 6 before Jesus ever came and said, I am come. I'm changing everything. And the life that I give you, it is much more powerful than just 120. In fact, you can continue on with this one. Because see, what it said about Moses at 120, his eyes had not abated. And his flesh was still the flesh of someone fresh. And what you have to understand is that is actually a Hebrewism or Hebrew saying, which simply meant that he was still at 120 capable of reproducing a child. That's what that meant. I said, Lord, I'll take the 120. I'll leave that reproducing of children at that point in time to my great, great grands. <laughs> Let them do that. <laughs> but I'll take the 120. So let's look at how this is talked about then in the New Testament. Acts chapter 7, verse 30 and 35 and 38. Now Stephen is preaching here. And this is what you would call, if, if you like, if you categorize you know, preaching, you have what you call a textual sermon. You would have one that is prophetic. You would have one that is historical incidents. All of these uh, topical, these are type sermons that you can preach. Okay. What Stephen gives us here is historical incidents. It's one of the most prophetic found examples of it because he walks them through their history how that God called our father Abraham while he was living in Mesopotamia and then he walks through the history 
right to that very moment. And look at how he talks about the situation of Exodus chapter 3. He said, and when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him, talking about Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord, in a flame of fire in a bush. I want you to bear in mind that this same angel later and it was the presence of angels showed up on this same Mount Sinai the third month after they were delivered out of Egypt. They said it was God. It was. Said this Moses, now this would be verse 35, whom they refused, they had rejected him earlier saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send. Here is your messenger principle, your Shalia principle. God sent him to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which was a messenger and Shalia to him, which appeared to him in the bush. In verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. This is how Stephen describes this incident. He said, this whole thing, you had the presence of the angel of the Lord, starting with Moses, when he's recommissioned, then when he brings them out at Mount Sinai, same angel. So it was really the angel of the Lord in this whole thing. Look at another couple of examples so that I can support this. It was the angel of the Lord in the pillar of cloud representing the Lord and protecting and guiding the children of Israel from the Egyptians. Acts chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Then in chapter 14, verse 19 and 20. And the angel of the Lord, now notice 13, he said, it was the Lord. Here in 14, he said, and the angel of the Lord, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, the, of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night. So you, I want you to see here the interchangeableness of the thought. It's the Lord, and yet it's the angel of the Lord. We're going to get right back into the broadcast in just a moment. But first, Michelle and I would like to thank all of our partners who helped to make this broadcast possible. You are wonderful examples of God's supply and excellent examples of of the New Testament principle of kingdom stewardship. By partnering together, we allow God to continue to release the message of God's kingdom from our hearts. We want to say thank you, and we thank God for you. Now, let's get back into the program. And Moses sent messengers 
sanctuary of principle, from Kadesh unto the kingdom of Eden. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travel that hath befallen us, and how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Again, just I'm just reading scripture to establish the consistency of the thought. It is there. So when Moses and other New Testament writers, when they talked about the giving of the law, how did they view that? It's the same Shalia principle that's there because it was through the agency of the angel of the Lord and other angels. And though the Lord takes full credit for the law, It came through the intermediary of the Shalia principle. So listen to Galatians 3 verse 19. Listen to this. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of the transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promises were made. So it tells us it was never the intention of God that the law as they understood it as it had existed for 1,500 years was to be permanent. He said, it was ordained. And this word here for ordained means to arrange thoroughly. It was instituted. It was prescribed. It was appointed. It was commanded, given, set in order, ordained. He said it was ordained by angels, this law, in the hand of a mediator. Now, when I first discovered that, I said, wow. I thought it said God gave it. And here, the apostle is saying it came through the hand. Of the angels. Well let's see if we can further get that. Acts chapter 7. Verse 52 to 53. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them. Which showed before of the coming of the just one. That is one of the the seven nouns. Describing the coming of the Lord. In fact. When you look at this in the Greek, it's the word eleusis. That is E-L-E-U-S-I-S. Eleusis. Coming of the just one. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Let me give you a third witness on this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And what I want you to see, as a threefold witness in the New Testament, was that they understood it was the Shalia principle in effect that day when the law was given. And it wasn't God in his essence, but it was God in his representative. Now, I really find this interesting. When I go back and I read Exodus 20, verse 1 and 2, and then I'll give you 19 and 21. And God spake all these words. I thought it, 
I thought the apostles said it came through the angels. But here it says, Exodus, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And then in verse 19, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. That was common thinking. If God, if God shows up, if God starts talking, you're about to transition out of here. And then in verse 21, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Moses consistently said, this was God. The apostles consistently said, this was his angel. Who was right? Both. You know, it's like when you're given, you know, some of these uh, questions, especially on standardized tests. Is it A, B, or C that's right? We could say, is it A or B that's right? And you answer, both. Because, you see, this is what it comes down to. Well, let me read you a couple more passages, and then I'm going to tell you what it comes down to. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, now Moses is talking to the new generation. He's about to escape this terrible wilderness. It was described as a great and terrible wilderness. I guess it depends on what side of the flat in the tent that you woke up on that day whether it was great or whether it was terrible. But it was the, he described it as a great and terrible wilderness, okay? He said to them, And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice, and he declared unto you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, ten sayings, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. How does ten statements become six over six hundred interpretations without man getting in there with his opinion. That's what it had become by the time Jesus came to earth. Over 600. Well, he said the Lord was the one. He was the voice of words. You heard his voice. He declared to you his covenant. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 4 and 6. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at the time to show you the word of the Lord. For ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now let's tie in these two things. How the apostles later gave us the true interpretation of what happened and how it's being described here by Moses. There is not inconsistency. It's just further understanding. You see, if I put it together, it means that whoever shows up in this realm as the representative is actually the sender. It's as though the sender is here. How does this tie in with us? How do you see your words that you speak? Are they just you rambling? 
Or do you realize that when you are sent on a specific mission from God, when you open your mouth as representative, that's not whatever your name is talking. The truth is, that's him. As long as you don't add your stuff to it. Does it flow through you, the vessel, and would have really the flavor of you in it? Absolutely. But here's the thing that you can't corrupt. Because the whole idea of corrupting means to get away from the original agenda. Like when we say that a computer file is corrupted, what are we saying? What it was originally intended to hold, that information is no longer there. What is the agenda of God? Now, whether you would speak as I would or not, that's not important whether you articulate it and flavor it the way that I would, that's equally immaterial. The point is, we cannot corrupt the message. Because if we do so, then we have violated our representation. Because the message that matters is the message of the sender. Peter was not Paul. Paul was not John. John was not Thomas. All of these men. And you go right through the list. All of these men were unique. But what was common about them is the message that they were sent with. And thus what they had to keep clear in their representation. And so you, whether you're talking angel of the Lord or the Lord himself is the same. But what's, what's clear here is the message was exactly the same. <laughs>We trust that you enjoyed the program today and that you are gaining wisdom each and every week. Now, also, that you're implementing the wisdom that you're gaining. Remember, God's kingdom is at hand and is right within your reach.